welcome to Soil Cloth Wine. My name is Natalie and I'm going to be showing you an interview today that I had the pleasure of taking with uh, James Bray. He is the owner and vintner at Tristatum Vineyards in uh, Willamette Valley and his winery specializes in Riesling and also sparkling. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with him specifically because he's doing a lot of very interesting winemaking techniques uh, that he's succeeding at, one of which is whole cluster, which we'll be more about in the interview. Um, so I'm glad to be able to share that with you, and here's the interview. Hello everyone, it's Natalie. I'm currently in some vineyards in Willamette Valley with James Frey. Um, we're here at Trisadum, and uh, it's currently setting, um, the sun is setting right now. We're in some vineyards. Uh, I was wondering if you could introduce maybe what we're currently looking at in terms of um, clones, rootstock, the way that you guys plant here. Yeah, so um, we're in the Ribbon Ridge AVA, uh, which is the smallest AVA here in Oregon. It's where we've got a 17 acre uh, vineyard planted here, uh, Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay and Riesling. And then right behind us here is the Trusanum Winery where we make uh, all of our wine. Uh, we're 100 percent of state fruit uh we have three vineyards uh one of them which is what we're standing in right now uh, which is ribbon ridge um in terms of clones pinot noir uh, uh, on, in this particular vineyard we're 40 percent pomard um 20 percent in Vains, Badensville, maybe 20 percent uh dijon 777 and then a little bit of, of curry clone as well in this particular vineyard Interesting. and what is your guys' house style? So our house style? Uh, it, that, I mean, that's a good question. I, I'm a big believer in single vineyard um, wines because I think, especially what we make here in the Willamette Valley, Pinot Noir, Riesling, Chardonnay to some extent, th those grapes do an amazing job of taking what's in the soil and, and putting it in the glass. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the majority of what we make here are single vineyard Pinot Noirs or single vineyard Rieslings. Uh, and so, for me, a house style is the the least the less I can do, uh, the less that I have to add or change. Um, if I can just basically harvest the fruit at the right time, um, no enzymes, no sulfur, no uh, uh, commercial yeast. For me, those make the most interesting, the most complex, um, the most varied wines from each of my three sites. And so I guess our house style is letting the site speak um, and me as a winemaker getting out of the way. I was interested in um, two things that you were just saying. So one was the fact that you're not using a commercial yeast strain. Um, you're doing natural ferments here? It depends. Um, I would say that probably 70% of what we do is native. So whatever comes in on the grapes, uh, that's what's going to ferment. Uh, there are certain years and certain times that we have uh, fermentations that seem to struggle. And if they struggle too long, then, um, then we may um, inoculate. And then uh, when we do sparkling wines, um, those are uh, wines that I traditionally inoculate. They're earlier in the season. They're the first things that we're picking. Um, and you really want very clean, um, you know, well-performing fermentation. So those would tend to see uh, some type of, of yeast. But by and large, Pinot Noir with Riesling, um, we try to let, um, let the native yeast that's on the grapes do the work for us. Awesome. So currently we're looking out over this vineyard and everything has been fully picked um, out. So the leaves have dropped. And one of my interests is in climate change and how that's affecting um, the wine sticks coming out of here. And you said that, of course, your house style here is to focus on terroir um, as one of the main components. And I'm interested, you've been here for 13 years. Um, and what type of changes you've seen to the flavor or any characteristics of the vineyards here um, and how that may affect maybe terroir going forward. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, that's a really good question. I think something that um, those of us in the wine industry and, and growers are particularly concerned about. Um, it, now with this vineyard, because I planted it in, in um, I, I purchased this piece of land in 2005 and planted it in 2007. Um, uh, it's uh, some of what I've seen over the years um, is really um, due to just the vines getting older. But what I have noticed in the last, uh, what we've noticed in the Willamette Valley over the last five years 
is just these warm, dry vintages that were, are really not the norm. In the, I mean, we most of us that came to the Willamette Valley to make Pinot Noir or, or, or make Chardonnay or make Riesling or sparkling wine, we came because it's a cool viticultural climate, right? It's it's cooler. You get these long hang times, um, which you really need for Pinot and, and for Riesling. And so what we've seen the last five years, really 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, five straight vintages now, much warmer temperatures, uh, much drier conditions, uh, earlier ripening. Now, Oregon's always kind of been on the edge of, um, you know, in, in you know, 20 years ago, you got just enough sunshine and just enough heat to ripen your fruit, and it was this dance with Mother Nature of could you get it ripe enough before the rains came and kind of washed out your vin your vintage. The last five years has been definitely much more of, um, hey, I'm going to have to pick earlier. I'm going to have to make sure the, the acids are preserved and, and not let the fruit get too ripe because we've had nothing but, but these warmer, drier uh, vintages. Now, how much is driven by climate change? How much uh, is just a, a cycle that we're in right now? Um, I think time will tell, but I think we are certainly a little bit nervous that um, things are getting a little warm. Um, and I think a lot of us love the cool vintages, the vintages that are a little longer, a little more difficult because you're waiting. They require a little bit more patience as you're waiting for the fruit to, to ripen. But, um, you know, yeah. like the coldest vintage we ever had, 2011, we were picking, it's November 20th today. We actually picked our last Riesling on November 20th in 2011. So we would still be out picking fruit right now um, back, in, back in, in 2011. Really hard, a lot of patience, difficult winemaking, um, a lot of challenges, but the wines I think are incredible. And I, I love them. It's one of my favorite vintages in the cellar right now is, are the, the Pinot Noirs and the Rieslings that came out of 2011. So I, I think our fear is that if we do see a general warming. Um, are we going to are we going to lose those kind of vintages here in Oregon, and and are we going to have to uh, become more adapt at at handling warmer vintages? Are we going to have to start planting our vineyards higher up on the hillside where it's cooler, uh, moving farther into the Coast Range Mountains or other places that that uh, that provide a little bit cooler? So I mean, time will tell, mm -hmm. but um, we're on a bit of a run here of of uh, harvests only in t-shirts, which mm. which is you know it's not that's not the yeah it's nice during <laughs> harvest. But um, it's not necessarily the, the norm uh, for, a, for a cool viticultural climate. Yes, for sure. You mentioned it had some um, impacts on your winemaking techniques and some challenges. And I was wondering if you could say maybe like one of those challenges and how you overcame that. Uh, sure. I, I, I think um, in a cool vintage, you're just you're waiting for Mother Nature to give you enough sunshine and enough heat to actually fully ripen your fruit. In a warm vintage, you got plenty of heat. So your bigger issue in a warm vintage, so in a cold vintage, you have plenty of acid. And cool viticultural winemakers love higher acid wines. It's why we make Pinot Noir. It's why we make Riesling. Um, I love those kind of wines. Um, but in a warmer vintage, um, things move very quickly and your acids, as your fruit is ripening, your acids are dropping. And if you're not in 2014, which was the kind of the first warm vintage of the last, you know, in this, this run of five that we've had, we were a little bit late. We weren't quite as, um, we didn't realize how quickly the acids were going to drop. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the next year we picked a little earlier, the next year we picked a little earlier. And so one adjustment I've made is I pick, I, I pick earlier and I pick much more, um, I'm looking at the acids much more than I used to. Uh, mm -hmm. Before I would maybe look at the, at, at the sugar levels, I would look at the, the, the level of ripeness, the flavors. I'm still looking at flavors, but I pay a lot of attention to acid. Um, for me, um, I, I'm not as fond of wines that, that you, you have to acidulate, and so I'd rather pick a little earlier. Um, and even if that means a little bit less ripeness and a little less alcohol, um, I, I'll take that over kind of waiting for, for more sugar development. Interesting. One of the questions I was really excited to ask you, um, basically as we're pushing towards a more warmer climate with this climate change and global warming, uh, we are going to see uh, our times for picking moving more forward. 
And here, uh, we spoke on a tour that I came on previously about how you use whole cluster fermentation. So for those of you guys that don't know, um, whole cluster fermentation is the use of the entire whole cluster of grapes um, that you let ferment with the stems rather than using a destemming technique. And the reason some winemakers are a little bit hesitant about using this is because you can get some green characteristics and you can also increase the chance of um, some microbes uh, developing during fermentation. And the wines that we tasted here, I didn't notice that. Um, but the thing that I'm interested about climate change is that as these uh, climates become more and more warm, do you foresee you guys using more whole cluster fermentation here because there's less risk of um, botrytis? Uh, yeah, um, I, I do actually see us using more whole cluster in awesome. the, in the warmer <laughs> in the warmer uh, vintages, um, but for for some different reasons. Um, and there's challenges with whole cluster too. So when you when you use whole clusters, um, the stems will cause your pH to shift more. So if you're normally if you're picking at at 3.3 pH and uh, you're destemming your fruit, the, the wine might finish at 3.6. Mm -hmm. um, if you add whole clusters, it might finish at 3.7 which for me in Pinot is, is too much of a pH shift. And so if you're going to use whole cluster, or if you can use 100% whole cluster, you're going to have to either pick a little earlier or you're gonna have to um, potentially uh, acidulate a little bit to not have your pH shift as much. So that's a challenge with whole cluster. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, I'll accept that challenge because I think in a warm vintage, uh, your stems lignify. Um, with whole cluster, a lot of it's about the stems. If your stems, uh, are underripe if they're green uh, and you chew on them, they're astringent, they're bitter, they're going to add those astringent characteristics to the wine. Mm -hmm. If you get nice ripeness in your stems and they're, they're a little bit more lignified and you chew on them and they're sweet or they're nutty, then they're going to add, um, for me, just a beautiful, there's an earthiness they bring to the wine, there's a freshness. Mm -hmm. The other thing about whole cluster is I find in warm vintages, when you destem your fruit, the, the wines can be just a little too fruity. Um, and they can just be too, all, fruity. too fruity, all too fruit. fruit. Okay. Um, and that's not as interesting, right? You want mm -hmm. wines with a little bit of complexity and nuance and, and, and you want some savory qualities, you want some earthiness, you want some spice. And I think the stems can help bring a little bit of that and they can bring a little bit of uh, just nuance to the wines. They can also bring freshness. So you, if your wines you know, might tend to being a little bit too fruit forward, a little too stewed, the, there's a freshness that comes from, from using the stem. So the biggest issue for me, uh, I, I like them in warm clusters and in, in warm vintages. I, I like I like using whole stems, um, whole clusters, but um, you just have to watch your acidity. So what was great about this last vintage, 2018, warm vintage, um, we got really good ripeness, but for me, at least in our, our three vineyards, we did not see the acids drop um, very fast. And so we were able to see kind of the full physiological development of the grapes, the, 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 the sugar ripeness that we were looking for, and we never saw the acids drop. So I was able to do almost, especially near the end of the, the vintage, I was doing 100% whole cluster fermentations and never having to, to do anything with the acidity because the, the, what we were picking at, at full ripeness, but we, were at, we had 3.20 pH. And so they're finishing at 3.5, 3.52, 3.55. Um, those are really good numbers for me. Um, and, and I really, I loved what was coming out of, of this particular vintage. And so it's early, but mm. it, it was an exciting, it was a fun vintage, uh, an easier vintage because we were in t-shirts. Um, <laughs> you were telling me a little bit about uh, tasting through some of the barrels today. And, uh, and I was wondering if you can tell us uh, a little bit about some of the characteristics that you were tasting through um, that you found particularly compelling from this vintage, maybe something that's different from other ones, or that uh, is typical, but you would think is a reflection of this land in this area and your child. Maybe. Yeah, so today um, I was in tasting Rieslings um, and just ch checking to see where our, our, especially our drier Rieslings, uh, they're all finishing their fermentations. They're not all quite done yet. Um, but uh, again, same story was with, with Pinot Noir really amazing acids. Um, in fact, with Riesling, I had to wait a little longer than I normally would just because the acids were so high that I just needed them to kind of come into a little bit more balance, which is a great situation, uh, especially if it's not raining. If you're mm -hmm. Botry the Botrytis in Riesling this year was some of the best Botrytis we've had um, for me in, in my 12 years of, of making wine in the Willamette Valley. Uh, beautiful dry Botrytis, noble rot, is exactly what you're looking for with Riesling. In, in Oregon, starts to rain later in the harvest and your botrytis in your Riesling can get a little bit 
fuzzy and gray and not not quite as noble. Um, this year, we it was it was quite noble, and and so what I'm finding in these rieslings are levels of of complexity uh, with the backbone of acidity that's just that is just carrying the wine from the beginning all the way through the end. So again, it's it's still early; they're still fermenting, um, but I think the hallmark really beautiful botrytis and just some of the best acidities we've we've seen here. Oh, I look forward to trying some of your Riesling that's coming out. That's going to be super Great. tasty. Great. Sounds like my I favorite. hope so. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to say bye to the people on live stream. Um, I'm still recording uh, the rest of the interview. Uh, James here also makes some art that is utilizing the byproducts of his winemaking and um, the vineyards here. So I'm going to be talking to him a little bit more about that because that's one of my fascinations. I hope you guys enjoyed watching um, and learned a little bit. I'll have more to add um, for those of you that want to know more about whole cluster or botrytis later on. But anyway, we're going to enjoy the sunset and keep talking. Have a good one, guys.